Hello and welcome to the Atoll, your home for Waterworld fandom. On today's collecting video, we'll be diving into all the various versions of Waterworld's soundtrack. But first, to kick off this video, I'd like to give a history and background of how Waterworld's musical score came to be. It is no secret that the production of Waterworld was an extremely challenging and at times troubled endeavor, with the unprecedented creation of large floating sets, shooting on the open ocean, engineering groundbreaking CGI visual effects not to mention the multiple Hollywood personalities clashing over creative decisions. So it may come as no surprise that the composing of Waterworld's score underwent its own set of challenges and drama. With the film under the direction of Kevin Reynolds, the legendary composer Mark Isom was hired to take a crack at Waterworld's soundtrack, formally working with Reynolds on The Beast. However, the full version of Isom's soundtrack was never recorded, and only really 25% of his version of the musical score was ever completed in demo form. Kevin Reynolds left Waterworld during post-production over creative differences with star Kevin Costner, who then became the acting director for this last stage of the film's production. Reportedly, after Costner's takeover, he rejected Mark Isom's soundtrack for being quote, too ethnic and bleak. That word, too ethnic, really makes me wince, especially when it comes from a Hollywood superstar who has built up his career playing the white savior trope in many films over the years. Regardless, Reynolds' cut of Waterworld with Isham's demos painted the Mariner as even more troubled and introspective than the final cut of the film. This had created arguments between Costner and Reynolds as how to best make the Mariner look more heroic and more appealing to audiences and the producers backing the project. And there's even this really hilarious and telling story of how Costner reacted to Isham's soundtrack demos upon first hearing them. According to fellow composer Brian Ralston, the story goes as quote, The way I heard it, Kevin Costner went over to Mark Isham's studio to listen to his first set of score demos for Waterworld. Isham played him a couple of cues. Costner said to him, Excuse me for a moment, may I use your restroom? Isham said, Sure. Costner went down the hall to the restroom. Isham sat there and waited, 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 waited. He got up to go see if Costner was okay since it had been so long. Costner was not in the restroom. He was not anywhere to be found. Isham looked outside and Costner's car was gone. He had simply sneaked out and left. And this may be just an urban legend as there are many surrounding this film because in an interview with Soundtrack.net, Isham says that it was Costner's decision to work with a composer that he had already had a relationship with and who could be trusted to create a soundtrack with very little directorial oversight as the production creamed into its tight summer 1995 deadline. Isham even claims in this interview that him and Costner are now friends, so who knows? But with that, Mark Isham was removed from the project, and you may be interested to know that in the Making of Waterworld book, Isham is cited as the sole composer on the project, most likely due to the book going to print before this change occurred at the very end of production. In the book, we get some very interesting quotes from then-director Kevin Reynolds about the direction him and Isham had in mind for the score. Quote, the whole picture is about a world made up of the vestiges of many different yet familiar cultures that had been mixed up together in a big cosmic blender. I wanted the music to reflect sounds that seemed unique to a culture, but that might have gone through two or three different incarnations over time. Ah, so it would seem that Isham's score is probably very much like the language of Portugreek, a combination of Portuguese and Greek that is spoken in Waterworld, a melding of multiple heritages. The score would have been very eclectic, borrowing from multiple musical traditions into a single unique sound. The book also mentions that Isham's score used water elements to give it a very fluid quality. And I would be very curious to hear Isham's demos from his version of the Waterworld soundtrack, but it seems that they have never been leaked onto the internet. And even the very first trailer and teaser trailer for Waterworld cite Mark Isham as the score's composer, but the teaser uses a John Williams track from Empire of the Sun, and the trailer uses a track called Wolf Moon Pow Wow from Immediate Music LLC, a company that specializes in movie trailer music. 
So, if you know any of Isham's demos that still exist, please let me know in the comments down below. However, I do have to say, we know for sure that one of Isham's Waterworld tracks still exists and even made it into the film, but we'll have to circle back around to that in a few minutes. With Mark Isham out, Costner brought in James Newton Howard, who he had worked with during the production of Wyatt Earp the year prior. Howard was tasked with punching up the score with a more adventurous and heroic tone, reminiscent of the films of Hollywood's golden age, specifically those of the Earl Flynn swashbuckling motion pictures. Howard also cites golden age composer Hugo Friedhofer, who created the scores for Zorro and Marco Polo in the 30s and 40s as another major influence. Though Howard says his largest influence was contemporary composer Jerry Goldsmith, who had created many scores for action films and television of the 80s and 90s, and is a composer who truly knows how to inject grandeur into his score by embracing slower than conventional tempo. Costner told Howard to trust his gut and give the score a sweeping, epic, romantic action-adventure influence, which is most apparent in the Mariner's theme, which is woven throughout the film and most outward in the action sequences. Waterworld is often cited as Howard's most action-oriented soundtrack in his long career, using what he calls orchestral violence, by letting the full symphony help to heighten the chaos of a scene as the action breaks forth on screen. Howard describes composing action music as exhausting, as he physically throws himself into the creation of the music, pounding on his keyboard. He found the long action sequences in the film, like the attack on the atoll, to be truly taxing days of work. Though of course, not all of Waterworld's score has high-flying action cues, and in fact, I think some of Waterworld's more low-key moments of music are its best. Take for example Enola's theme, which is first introduced in the track Prodigal Child, but then blooms into the majestic dry land theme at the end of the film. And of course, there is the track Swimming, which is the tranquil background music for all the videos on this YouTube channel. Though bringing on Howard so close to the film's completion meant that he'd only have six weeks to compose the entire score, though a decade later he would only have four weeks to compose Peter Jackson's King Kong score. The tight deadline required Howard to compose five minutes of music per day, as compared to his regular two minutes a day on a typical project. Lucky for Howard, fellow composer Hans Zimmer, who had become a fan of Howard for his work on Grand Canyon, learned of the short deadline and gifted him his entire massive library of samples. And the two composers would later go on to score Batman Begins and The Dark Knight together. Using an Akai MPC-60 for samples and sequencing, Howard added wind and string voices from the sample library over the orchestral recordings to create an otherworldly quality to the score. Howard also got help from Steve Porcaro, one of the founding members of Toto, to add some sparkly synthesizer effects onto the score, which come through most prominently on the track Swimming. In the end, Howard, despite the tight deadline, created one of his finest scores, which is at times ruckus and big, and at times subtle and meditative. Howard describes the score in his own words as disturbingly good, and Costner would call again on Howard to create another post-apocalyptic score two years later for The Postman. Now that we have an overview of Waterworld's score and the troubled but triumphant production that led to its creation, let's have a look at how the score arrived to us, the fans and consumers, in the form of a purchasable movie soundtrack on various audio formats. First up, we have the standard Waterworld soundtrack on CD, published by MCA at the same time as the theatrical run of the film. The front cover displays the Mariner's face under a setting sun superimposed with Enola's tattoo, which of course is the same image used in much of Waterworld's promotional materials as well as the home releases of the film. On the back side of the CD case is a photograph of the open atoll gates inviting us into its calm lagoon inside the floating city's walls. Laid on top of the photograph is the playlist in a wavy font pattern. This CD boasts 24 tracks with a total runtime of 52 minutes, with each track taking us through the major moments in the film. Opening up the CD jewel case, we are welcomed with the CD itself printed with the surface of a stormy ocean and the title, Waterworld, printed in small font above the center hole, a very classy look. 
And on the other side of the inside of the case is the back side of the CD booklet, printed with a stripped down version of Enola's tattoo, made grey on an all black background. Taking the booklet out of the case and having a look inside, we have another track list over some images of the film. The score's credits including producers and musicians that accompanied Howard in his creation, and then on the final page, some more images of the film and a special thank you section, which I presume was written by Howard. The CD soundtrack is a bit of a relic of an earlier time in cinematic history and one that I reflect on quite fondly. Movie soundtracks of the 70s, 80s, and 90s were actually incredibly profitable parts of the film's merchandising. And it's interesting to note that Kevin Costner in Whitney Houston's film The Bodyguard has the best-selling soundtrack of all time, so I think it goes without saying that if you're a fan of Waterworld and its score, the standard CD soundtrack is an absolute must-have for your collection. Moving on to our next artifact, let's have a look at the soundtrack released on audio cassette. Yes, Waterworld being a mid-90s film had its soundtrack released on tape as well. And interestingly, cassette tapes really had a very long run as a piece of consumer audio medium, being first the second most common audio format alongside vinyl in the 70s and 80s, and then continuing alongside compact discs in the 90s and early 2000s. The audio cassette version of the Waterworld soundtrack almost completely parallels the CD version with the Mariner setting sun image on the front and a list of the tracks on the back along with the corresponding side of the cassette they appear on. Opening up the case, we find the cassette itself is very plainly branded with the MCA logo and the track names on their matching sides. Taking out the paper insert, we find the same track list credits and special thanks section as the CD booklet, but reconfigured to the tape's cassette insert dimensions and folds. And though the tape version of the soundtrack does not offer any additional content over its CD counterpart, I do think it's a very interesting piece of my Waterworld collection, showing a time before the internet when movie soundtracks were flourishing at record stores on multiple audio formats. And while you might think that the official soundtrack on CD and tape is where this collection ends, you would be wrong as there is a second official release of the soundtrack in 2017, that being the limited edition expanded soundtrack by La La Land Records. La La Land Records is a company that specializes in limited runs of remastered and expanded movie and television soundtracks for the collecting market. The expanded Waterworld soundtrack has this impressive cover art which looks like an original painting of the Mariner and Helen with the atoll lingering in the background. On the back side of the jewel case we have this glorious photoshopped image of the atoll with all war breaking out, which I should mention has been used on several pieces of Waterworld marketing. Under that is the track list for over 40 individual songs living up to its title as the expanded soundtrack with over an hour and a half of content. In the lower left corner is a note saying that this is a limited edition item with only 3,000 units created, and that is why you'll find the CD goes actually for quite a bit on eBay. Luckily I held out and waited for a deal to come up and snag this copy for around $10. Opening up the jewel case, we are greeted by not one, but two audio CDs. Both CDs have a simple watery background along with the title, CD number company logos, and the arrow straight to dry land. In the back inside of the jewel case is an image of the open atoll gates, and going back to the inside front, we get this thick insert booklet. This booklet contains a retrospective essay about the creation of Waterworld soundtrack, which mostly centers around an interview with James Newton Howard. In the interview, he gives some great insight not only into the formation of Waterworld soundtrack, but his movie scoring process in general. This served as my main source of research for the first part of this video and is a great read if you're interested in the craft of movie scoring. The booklet also contains information about the specific limited edition release and an extended credits section. But now, let's have a look at the actual content contained on these audio CDs. The main theatrical tracks are all here, along with some additional tracks not in the original MCA Waterworld soundtrack, but present in the film. Tracks like Hydroholic, Enola Overboard, Slave Colony, Rowing, and Bungie. 
Also, on the second CD are a total of nine bonus tracks, most of which are demos or alternative versions of the main tracks. And to be completely honest, most of these bonus tracks sound really similar to the versions used in the final film, and I must admit I had trouble distinguishing the differences between a few of these different versions. However, in the alternative version of Helen Frees the Mariner, you can pick up on a slightly different take on the Mariner's hero theme. And there's also the bonus track, Three on Deck, which is a completely unreleased song before the CD and is definitely my favorite of the bonus tracks, combining dark and dreamy themes. Also contained within the bonus tracks is Lo and Behold, one of Mark Isham's original compositions, that being the music box theme. And this is in fact the very music you hear at the end of the film as Enola lists the lid of the music box after arriving at dry land. And did you know she is in fact humming the same tune throughout the film, subtly hinting at her connection to dry land and the deep memories she retains from her time spent there. And I think it's really interesting that despite Aisham's score being thrown out of the film, this small contribution lived on in the final cut. The bonus tracks also contain the recorded thank you and wrap up speech given by James Newton Howard and Kevin Costner to the orchestra after finishing the score. Howard says this about composing Waterworld's score with his orchestra. We've done you know, over 40 movies together now in the last several years. and. Um... I've never enjoyed any of them uh, as much as I've enjoyed this one, so. And Costner claims... Uh, I've enjoyed these last seven, eight days. It's been a difficult year in my life. And um, this has been a really high highlight for me. And uh, I hope you take a great amount of pride in, in what you've uh, been able to do uh, for me. A little bit ego-driven, if you ask me and sorry for coming down so hard on Costner in this video. But I have to mention, there is one prominent track in the film that does not make its way into any of the released soundtracks. That is, of course, the Peter Gunn theme by Henry Mancini, which plays as the Deacon drives his Deacon mobile through the rusted bowels of the Dees. But it does make an appearance at the live stunt show at Universal Studios as the Deacon rolls in on the Smoker Warboat. So I have to suspect that this track may have not made it on to any of the retail soundtracks because of some sort of licensing agreement. Just a note here, as I was editing the video, I realized that in the extended cut of Waterworld, there's actually a Miles Davis song that plays from an ancient CD Walkman as Helen and the Mariner converse on the bow of the Trimoran. This song too never made it into any of the release soundtracks. Also, I wanted to mention that parts of the film's soundtrack play during the entire runtime of the stunt show, as well as being piped into the area just outside of the show's gates. But anyways, back to the regular video. All in all, I'd have to say that I'm really proud to own this limited edition expanded soundtrack. It's a beautifully put together collector's item, however, considering the bonus alternative and demo tracks are so similar to those in the versions of the film, I would have to say this CD collection is probably only prized by the most enthusiastic Waterworld collectors or fans of James Newton Howard's movie scores. But before I close out this video, I have to give one special shout out to a piece of Waterworld physical audio that I don't actually own, and that is the vinyl of Waterworld Super Nintendo Entertainment System video game soundtrack. That's right, the legendary and cult status soundtrack composed by Dean Evans for the Waterworld SNES game received an LP release from Moonshake Records. And if you have never listened to this soundtrack, do yourself a favor after this video and search the track Diving and thank me later. Dean Evans' video game score is a masterpiece and really serves as a supplementary soundtrack for the Waterworld fandom. And be sure to check out my video on all the Waterworld video games for even more information on the different soundtracks for each version of the game.
But regardless, Moonshake Records, a company that specializes in physical releases of video game music, has honored this hidden gem with this beautiful two record vinyl release, complete with this painterly album art and these transparent blue splattered records. A truly magnificent piece of physical media, even if it is a bit too pricey for me to add to my own collection. Well, there you have it, that's my exhaustive look at Waterworld's score, as well as a look at all the released versions of the soundtrack. I hope you really enjoyed this deep dive, and if you did, feel free to give it a thumbs up, and if you haven't already, I would greatly appreciate your subscription to this channel. We recently passed our 500 subscriber milestone, which means we are officially halfway to our goal of 1,000 subscribers, so by pressing that subscribe button, you're going to be part of us meeting this pivotal channel goal. Also, if you'd like to reach out to me directly, check out the ATOL Instagram where I also post frequently, link in the description below. But with that, thanks, as always, for joining me at the ATOL.